I was only 18 years old, having dinner with my new girlfriend's parents for the first time. I was desperately trying to make a good impression when the conversation took a turn I wasn't prepared for. They had met Steve and Claire Phillips three days earlier at one of our summer picnics and wanted to know more about them. Steve and Claire were nice people and I really liked them. I even had a little secret. I was the best man at their wedding. How that wedding came about is a whole other story. In the neighborhood where I grew up, there were Saturday night dances in the summer. Sometimes there was live music, but on the best nights, we would spin records. I was 17 at the time. It was the first Saturday night dance of the summer, and I was standing next to Steve Phillips. Steve was about 35 years old and married to Jean. She was very attractive and carried herself with confidence, but she didn't always treat Steve well. Steve was a kind man, but Jean seemed to take him for granted. Even at 17, I could tell that something wasn't right in their marriage. Everyone in the neighborhood knew that a married woman should be faithful to her husband, and Jean's behavior made people uncomfortable. Despite that, Steve seemed to put up with it. I never understood why. Things came to a head at the first summer Saturday night dance when Jean brought a friend with her. He didn't know anyone there except Jean, but he acted like he owned the place. We all looked at Steve, who was standing against the wall, watching his wife dance with her friend. It was a family-oriented gathering, so there were certain things you just didn't do. It wasn't acceptable to bring someone else to a dance like that, and Jean's friend was making people uneasy. When the neighbors had had enough, several of the wives approached Jean and her friend and asked them to leave. He protested, but then the husband stepped in and settled the matter. As they left the dance hall, the friend looked back at Steve and smirked. Jean leaned towards Steve, smiling broadly, and kissed him before they both walked out. As I stood next to Steve, watching them leave, I couldn't understand why he put up with it. I was just a teenager, but I looked at Steve and asked, Why do you put up with this? He looked at me with a crushed expression and said, Look at me, Jake. How else am I going to get a woman like Jean? I wanted to say that he deserved better, but she was still his wife, and I needed to show some respect for him. Finally, I looked at him and said, When are you going to stop trying to impress others and find someone who makes you happy? To my surprise, he didn't get angry. He just stood there, looking at me with glassy eyes until he started nodding his head. Two weeks later, Steve asked Jean to file for divorce. He'd finally had enough. That evening, when Jean came home, the neighbors could hear her yelling, though they didn't catch every word. I found out about it the next day. In our neighborhood, news travels fast. The most memorable line of the evening was when Stephen Phillips said, Either you stop this divorce nonsense right now, or I'm going to leave you, and you'll never see me again. I thought that was the best example of an empty threat and laughed about it for days. Steve had made his decision, but he was not a happy man. Jean soon moved out, but he continued to go about his business, seemingly in a daze. However, his life was soon to change. Steve was hardly seen that summer, and we assumed he had locked himself away in his house. We were wrong. The orchestra was playing, couples were dancing, and then Steve walked in with someone who wasn't Jane. You know how in movies, when the action stops, the room gets quiet, and you can only hear the crickets chirping outside the window. It felt like that. Even the orchestra sensed something was different and stopped playing. All eyes turned to Claire, a pretty, albeit somewhat shy, middle-aged woman who was now with Steve. She seemed momentarily taken aback by the attention and even took a step back, concerned that everyone was watching her. I don't know who started clapping first, but within a minute, everyone in the room was applauding this unassuming couple who had entered the dance hall, intending to dance a few times and for Steve to introduce Claire to the neighbors. But that's not how it went down. 
Several people near the door approached the couple and began introducing themselves. Moments later, several of the wives single play out, and she found herself surrounded by smiling faces with lots of questions. She seemed to enjoy the attention. Claire danced every other dance with Steve that night, but in between, each husband took turns welcoming her to the dance floor. No one had time to dance with Claire for too long before someone else cut in, but no one complained. The wives made sure Steve wasn't bored on the dance floor either, and the happy couple went home with the warm feeling that only comes from acceptance and good friends. A few months later, on a sunny afternoon, in early winter, I met Steve on the street and casually asked him how he and Claire ended up together. This is how he told the story, without any additions or omissions. I was still a little surprised by what he shared, but then he had something to ask me to. That Thursday morning, the day after Steve handed Jane the divorce papers, his secretary, who had worked with him for seven years, walked into his office and closed the door behind her. So, boss, what's going on? All week you've been ignoring everyone, and this isn't like you. What happened? Not this time. I'm the one who did something. I filed for divorce, Steve said. Claire let out a cheer, jumped up, and punched the air. It's about time, Steve. You can do so much better. I thought this day would never come. You should celebrate. Funny, I don't feel much like celebrating, he said. I mean, I couldn't live like this anymore. It had to end. I still felt like a part of me had died, and that part of me was lost forever. Steve, trust me, this is just the beginning of a much better life. Claire hesitated, then uncharacteristically, leaned over and kissed his cheek. Smiling, she turned and left the room, but not without taking one last look back at Steve. Friday morning brought Steve the first of two big surprises. Claire walked into his office and said, Boss, you're coming to my house for a home-cooked dinner tonight. How do you like your tenderloin potatoes and asparagus with hollandaise sauce? Steve appreciated the gesture but replied, Thanks, really, but I don't think I'd be good company. Did that sound like a request to you? Claire looked him over, smiled briefly, and said, You're joining us for a home-cooked dinner tonight. Be there at seven, and don't be late. What was he to do? Another night alone would be no better than the last five. Besides, he had to please Claire, or his life at the office would be no better than at home. At seven o'clock p.m., he stood at her door with a bottle of wine in his left hand and his right hand on the bell. The door opened, Claire peeked out from behind it, smiled, and invited him in. He was still in a daze after handing Jane the papers and was almost unaware of what was going on around him. He heard the door close and turned to say, I really don't think I'll be good company tonight, but the words never came out. Steve was telling me the story and looked me in the eye when he said, I turned around to look at her, and she was wearing red high-heeled shoes. I thought about it for a moment and said, that sounds nice. I guess the color red means she was having fun. No, you don't understand, he said. All she was wearing was a pair of red high-heeled shoes. He smiled in a way I'd never seen him smile before. For a moment, I remembered your words to me that night at the dance and thought, that woman could make me happy too. To tell the truth, she has always made me happy. I just didn't realize until that moment how much she had become a part of my life. Now, I really didn't know what to say. After much thought, the only thing I could come up with was, so how was dinner? Good, he replied, by this time smiling. We didn't eat until almost midnight, but it was great. Now I was at a loss for words and really didn't know what to say back to him. Jean's treatment of him had kept me awake for a long time. I had nightmares several times in which I woke up to the realization that I was married to someone as unfaithful as Jean. I was beginning to think that maybe now those nightmares would leave me. Jake, I have a favor to ask of you. Claire, 
and I are getting married in about five months, and I'd like you to be my best man. This was something I didn't expect. I told him I was touched but asked if he had a closer friend he'd rather have. He said I was there for him during his divorce and he wanted me to be there for him during the wedding as well. How can you say no to a request like that? I agreed and said I would do my best, but I didn't know how that promise would turn out. I won't even try to tell you about the bachelor party I threw when I wasn't old enough to buy alcohol. That's a whole other story. The wedding day came, and I was standing with the groom a little ways down the aisle when the maid of honor tapped me on the shoulder. The bride would like to speak to the best man, she said. I looked at Steve, he shrugged, and I stepped back to talk to the bride. I had heard stories about brides on their wedding day, and the walk to the back of the church felt more like the last mile. I was led into the bride's dressing room and was immediately surrounded by the entire wedding party. I felt trapped. Claire looked beautiful. She smiled at me and started by asking, How is the groom holding up? It was an easy question. I replied, He's perfectly fine and looking forward to the wedding. The bridesmaids laughed a little and I figured I was doing just fine. The bride then asked, Do you know the duties of a best man? I replied, I have three duties, not losing the ring, giving a good toast, and not embarrassing the bride. All the bridesmaids laughed a little louder. I was on a roll. The bride was smiling. No, she said. I mean, do you know the traditional role of the best man? I didn't have a clue. I was stumped. She said, if for some reason the groom cannot officiate the wedding, it is up to the best man to marry the bride. This caused the newlyweds to laugh uncontrollably. They enjoyed this little performance at my expense. The bride was smiling, yet looking at me without taking her eyes off me. I knew it was her day, and I had to proceed with caution, but I also knew I couldn't let her go unpunished. After a moment, I said, I'm told you look great in red shoes. At those words, all the bridesmaids shrieked and screamed with laughter. The bride's eyes widened, and she hid her face in her palms. Through her fingers, I could see that she was blushing every shade of red, and it was obvious that the whole bridal party knew the story. After a while, she raised her head and said with a smile, Yes, yes, I know. This caused another explosion of laughter from the newlyweds. Finally, she said, Tell the groom I'll be there soon, and I happily departed. When I got back to Steve, he asked, What was that? I just shrugged and replied, shoes. He must have been more nervous than I thought because he just nodded as if it was the most natural thing to do, and we went back to silently waiting for the bride to come out. A few minutes later, the bride walked down the aisle to smiles and tears on both sides. As she stood in front of the altar with her hands interlocked with her grooms, she leaned back, and behind his back, she smiled at me and blew me a kiss. Now it was my turn to blush, and I turned all shades of red. And then I remembered the third duty of the best man. The bride always has the last word. 